Hey, Grace Bible Church. We are now in Acts 26 for our daily Bible study. We've made it to May, May 1st, two, uh, 2020. Um, in Acts 26, we it's not the climax of the book, but I think it's some of the highest drama in the book because it's Paul's audience before Festus and Agrippa II and his sister Bernice. I misspoke yesterday and said it was his wife, I think. But uh, actually Bernice is Agrippa's sister. And remember, Agrippa is the great grandson of Herod the Great, the Herod who tries to kill the baby Jesus at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. Agrippa's family has been, um, they've all been client kings of the Romans for, five, for four generations. They've been Jewish for five generations. And Festus basically said, um, Agrippa, help me figure out what to do with this guy named Paul. I'm, not a, I'm a Roman. I'm not Jewish. Uh, you've been around the Jews your entire life. Uh, Agrippa would have been, you know, eight years old or so, five years old, eight years old, something like that when Jesus was crucified. So he would, would have been very knowledgeable. Festus says, help me figure out what to do with this guy named Paul. Well, Paul... Paul begins his case in chapter 26, and first of all, he affirms Agrippa's Jewishness. He says, uh, you're so well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Paul's pleased to be able to talk to him. And then Paul, in verses 4 through 8, affirms his Jewishness. And again, he says, you know, I, I have been a member of the strictest sect of our religion. I've been a Pharisee. I, uh, I am on trial today because because of what God has promised our fathers, the promise of the 12 tribes of Israel. So he affirms how he is not uh, rebelling against his religious upbringing. He thinks he is accurately teaching what his religion says. And then, he, then we read beginning in verse 9 through um, verse 18, our, the third time we read in the book of Acts about Paul's conversion. So we read about it first in Acts 9. We read it about again in Acts 22 when Paul is first in Jerusalem two years earlier. This is the third account we have of Paul's conversion, and Paul adds something to it, something that we have that has not been mentioned before. In verse 14, the, the voice of Jesus says to Paul, not just Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me, but also says, it is hard for you to kick against the goads. And goads were a shepherd's tool. They were basically sharp sticks that they used to poke in the, the hamstrings of sheep or cattle to get them to go where they wanted to go. It was impossible to rebel against goads. I mean, uh, because the animals couldn't kick back far enough to reach the person holding the stick. Uh, very painful. You, you, were, you were at the mercy of your shepherd when the shepherd had the goads. And that's what God is saying here to Paul. Uh, basically, you're mine. I have you now. There's no point in continuing to persecute me. You belong to me. So Paul tells uh, Agrippa and Festus and Bernice all this. Then he makes it clear that his job is to teach this message to the Gentiles. And that is, Paul says, why the Jews are so angry at him. Not because he's leading a, a rebellion against Rome, not because he's trying to desecrate the temple, and really not even because he's trying to alter the Jewish faith. Um, he, everything he's saying, that's been his point all throughout uh, the book of Acts since his conversion in chapter 9, everything Paul says is completely compatible and is indeed a fulfillment of, compatible with and a fulfillment of the Hebrew scriptures. The Jews, therefore, are accusing him before Festus because of their ethnic pride, because of racism, because they don't like the fact that Paul has taken uh, the message of Jesus and the message of the Hebrew Scriptures to the Gentiles. But then Paul mentions, you know, the, the, sum, the great summation of his argument, verses 22 to 23, he mentions the resurrection. He says, I have had God's help to this very day, and so I stand here and testify to small and great alike I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer, and as the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to his own people and the Gentiles. And at this point, even though Paul's been speaking basically to Agrippa, Festus is the one who interrupts. And he says, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning has driven you insane. 
Now, a couple of things to note there. Uh, Festus notes that Paul is an educated man, and he was. He was a highly educated man. He was brilliant. Absolutely, I mean, he was a genius on the level of maybe six other people in world history. Everybody agrees with that. If somebody, you know, if millions of people are gathering to read your writings 2,000 years after they were written, and if they're gathering every week to study what you wrote, you can call yourself one of the rare geniuses who have ever lived. Pe Festus knew that. Paul is genius. But, you know, just like, you know, maybe, but Festus is saying, Paul, maybe you studied a little too hard. Maybe you went too deep in your brain and you knocked some screws loose because this talk about Jesus coming back from the dead is absolutely insane. It's crazy talk. And Paul replies in verse 25, I am not insane, most, Festus, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. And so Paul comes back at Festus and he says, uh, Governor Festus, with all due respect, there is a big difference between you and me. I'm looking at the facts. I'm looking at the history. I'm trying to understand the, what happened with the empty tomb and what happened with all the sightings of Jesus after his, uh, after his tomb was empty. Uh, I'm trying to explain what, why the guards at the tomb said what they did. I'm trying to explain all the miracles that have happened. I'm trying to explain why all these people all over the world are saying this is true. I'm dealing with these facts. I'm dealing with history. You, Festus, you're doing philosophy. You have a philosophical objection to the resurrection. You say, there is no way a dead man can come back to life. And that's fine if you want to do that. That's fine. But just admit what you're doing. Okay? I'm dealing with facts, and you're dealing with philosophy. You're not engaging with what, I'm, with what all the evidence has said for the last 30-some-odd years. So Paul says, I'm not insane. I'm trying to deal with what actually happened to Jesus. And uh, Andy also says in verse... 26, this, none of this was done in a corner. These are well-known, well-established public facts. It was the talk of the world for decades. When we do evangelism, it's good to think back to Paul's example here. We got to make it clear when we're doing evangelism, when we're telling people about Jesus, that we are dealing with history. We are dealing with facts. We are dealing with the historical fact that this man named Jesus rose from the dead, and we need to challenge people lovingly, but challenge them, what are you going to do about these facts? How can you explain these facts? And I don't think anybody really can explain these facts in a satisfactory way, apart from the fact that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Um, you know, Paul basically has Agrippa saying the same thing many people have said to me. I don't think people can rise from the dead. That's why I'm not a Christian, and we need to respond with Paul's argument, okay? That's great. You can believe that if you want to, but you're believing in the teeth of the evidence, okay? I want you to deal with evidence. I'm trying to get you to deal with facts. Um, secondly, you know, a lot of people will say things like, uh, it's very common in our culture today when you're speaking with people about your religious beliefs for them to say, well, if that works for you, that's great. You know, I'm glad it works for you. That's your truth. You need to speak your truth, but it's not what I believe. It's not my truth. It doesn't work for me. And I love what Paul does here. Paul is basically saying to Festus, I did not want this to be true. My whole life is an example of how I, I was just the opposite. I didn't want Jesus to be true. I didn't want the resurrection to be true. This wasn't fulfilling to me. I lost everything I had in order to follow Jesus. So, you know, if you're going to believe this, Festus, don't believe it because it fulfills you. It didn't fulfill me, but I had to acknowledge the facts that this, this man named Jesus is now Christ, Messiah, and Lord. And I'm calling on you to believe this too, Festus. And we need to tell people the same thing when they try to pull that, if it works for you, stuff with us. And then Paul shifts his atten attention back to Agrippa. He says in verse 26 through 29, The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. Again, these were public facts. This was... They didn't have newspapers back then, but if they had had newspapers back then, it would have been on the front page every single day. Uh, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. And there, again, Paul is trying to is tying it all back to the Hebrew Scriptures, saying, I'm a faithful Jew. Agrippa, you as a Jew, do you believe this? And then Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? And it's almost comical. You know, Paul's in chains. 
he's the one on trial, but he's such a gifted debater that he turns it around, and now, now Agrippa's on trial. Are, are you going to believe this or not? And Paul says, short time or long, I pray that God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am except for these chains. And um, then, then Agrippa says, I've had enough. He leaves, Festus leaves, and that's the end of Paul's hearing in front of the governor, and that's the end of our study on Acts 26. So let's pray now, and then we'll be done. Father, thank you for this day. And we just, you know, just a marvel at the Apostle Paul and uh, how wonderfully you gifted him for his mission to be an apostle. And I thank you for how much we can learn from his example about how to argue persuasively for the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and what it looks like to do that. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.